Hi, friends. <clears throat> Here is chapter nine, the mock turtle story. You can't think how glad I am to see you again, you dear old thing, said the Duchess, as she tucked her arm affectionately into Alice's, and they walked off together. Alice was very glad to find her in such a pleasant temper, and thought to herself that perhaps it was only the pepper that had made her so savage when they met in the kitchen. When I'm a Duchess, she said to herself, not in a very hopeful tone, though, I won't have any pepper in my kitchen at all. Soup does very well without. Maybe it's always pepper that makes people hot-tempered, she went on, very much pleased at having found out a new kind of rule. And vinegar makes them sour. Hmm. And chamomile that makes them bitter. And, and barley sugar and such things that make children sweet-tempered. I only wish people knew that. Then they wouldn't be so stingy about it, you know. She had quite forgotten the Duchess by this time and was a little startled when she heard her voice close to her ear. You're thinking about something, my dear, and what makes you forget to talk? I can tell you just now what the moral of that is, but I shall remember it in a bit. Perhaps it hasn't one, Alice ventured to remark. Tut, child, said the Duchess. Everything's got moral, if only you can find it. And she squeezed herself up closer to Alice as she spoke. Alice did not much like keeping so close to her, first because the Duchess was very ugly, and secondly because she was exactly the right height to rest her chin upon Alice's shoulder, and it was an uncomfortably sharp chin. However, she did not like to be rude, so she bore it as well as she could. The game's going on rather better now, she said, by way of keeping up the conversation a little. Tis so, said the Duchess, and the moral of that is, oh, tis love, tis love that makes the world go round. Somebody said, Alice whispered, that it's done by everybody minding their own business. Ah, well, it means much the same thing, said the Duchess, digging a sharp little chin into Alice's shoulder as she added, and the moral of that is, take care of the sense, and the sounds will take care of themselves. How fond she is of finding morals in things, Alice thought to herself. I dare say you're wondering why I don't put my arm around your waist, the Duchess said after a pause. The reason is that I am doubtful about the temper of your flamingo. Shall I try the experiment? He might bite, Alice cautiously replied, not feeling at all anxious to have the experiment tried. Mm, very true, said the Duchess. Flamingos and mustard both bite, and the moral of that is, a birds of a feather flock together. <laughs> Only, mustard isn't a bird, Alice remarked. Right, as usual, said the Duchess. What a clear way you have of putting things. It's a mineral, I think said Alice. Of course it is, said the Duchess, who seemed ready to agree with anything that Alice said. There's a large mustard mine near him, and the moral of that is, the more there is of mine, the less there is of yours. Oh, I know, exclaimed Alice, who had not attended to this last remark. It's a vegetable. It doesn't look like one, but it is. I quite agree with you, said the Duchess. And the moral of that is, be what you would seem to be, 
Or if you'd like it put more simply, never imagine yourself not to be otherwise than what it might appear to others that what you were or might have been was not otherwise than what you had been would have appeared to them to be otherwise. I think I should understand you better, Alice said very politely. If I had it written down... But I can't quite follow you as you say it. That's nothing if what I choose to say, the Duchess replied in a pleased tone. Pray, don't trouble yourself to say any longer than that, Alice said. Oh, don't talk about trouble, said the Duchess. I make you a present of everything I've said as of yet. A cheap sort of present, thought Alice. I'm glad they don't give birthday presents like that. But she did not venture to say it aloud. Thinking again? The Duchess asked, with another dig of a sharp little chin. I've a right to think, said Alice sharply, for she was beginning to feel a little worried. Just about as much right, the Duchess said, as pigs have to fly. And the... But here... To Alice's great surprise, the Duchess's voice died away, even in the middle of her favourite word, moral. And the arm that was linked in hers began to tremble. Alice looked up, and there stood the Queen in front of them, with her arms folded, frowning like a thunderstorm. A fine day, Your Majesty. <laughs> The Duchess began in a low, weak voice. Now, I give you fair warning, shouted the Queen, stamping on the ground as she spoke. Either you or your head must be off, and that in about half no time. Take your choice. The Duchess took her choice and was gone in a moment. Let's go on with the game. The Queen said to Alice, and Alice was too much frightened to say a word, but slowly followed her back to the croquet ground. The other guests had taken advantage of the Queen's absence and were resting in the shade. However, the moment they saw her, they hurried back to the game, the Queen merely remarking that a moment's delay would cost them their lives. All the time they were playing, the Queen never left off quarrelling with the other players and shouting, Off with his head! Or, Off with her head! Those who she sentenced were taken into custody by the soldiers, who, of course, had to leave off being archers to do this, so that by the end of the half an hour or so, there were no archers left, and all the players, except the King, the Queen, and Alice, were in custody and under sentence of execution. Then the Queen left off, quite out of breath, and said to Alice, Have you seen the mock turtle yet? No, said Alice. I don't even know what mock turtle is. It's the thing mock turtle soup is made from, said the Queen. I never saw one or heard of one, said Alice. Come on, then said the Queen, and he shall tell you his story. As they walked off together, Alice heard the King say in a low voice to the company generally, You are all pardoned. Come, that's a good thing, she said to herself, for she had felt quite unhappy at the number of executions the Queen had ordered. They very soon came upon a griffin, lying fast asleep in the sun. If you don't know what a griffin is, look at the picture. Up, lazy thing, said the queen, and take this young lady to see the mock turtle and to hear his story. I must go back and see after them executions that I have ordered. And she walked off, leaving Alice alone with the griffin. Alice did not quite like the look of the creature, but on the whole she thought it would be quite as safe to stay with it as to go after that savage queen. So she waited. The griffin sat up and rubbed his eyes. Then it watched the queen till she was out of sight, and then it chuckled. <laughs> what fun, said the griffin, half to itself and half to Alice. What is the fun, 
said Alice. Why, she, said the griffin. It's all her fancy, that. They never executes nobody. You know, come on. Everybody says come on here, thought Alice, as she went slowly after it. I never was so ordered about in all my life. Never. They had not gone far before. They saw the mock turtle in the distance, sitting sad and lonely on a little ledge of rock. And, as they came nearer, Alice could hear him sighing as if his heart would break. She pitied him deeply. What is this? What is this sorrow? She asked the griffin. And the griffin answered, very nearly in the same words as before. It's all his fancy, that. He hasn't got no sorrow, you know. Come on. So they went up to the mock turtle, who looked at them with large eyes full of tears, but said nothing. This here young lady, said the griffin, she wants to know your story, she do. I'll tell it to her, said the mock turtle in a deep, hollow tone. Sit down, both of you, and don't speak a word till I've finished. So they sat down and nobody spoke for some minutes. Alice thought to herself, I don't see how he can even finish if he doesn't begin. But she waited patiently. Once, said the mock turtle at last with a deep sigh, I was a real turtle. These words were followed by a very long silence, broken only by an occasional exclamation of, <coughs> from the griffin, and the constant heavy sobbing of the mock turtle. Alice was very nearly getting up and saying, Thank you, sir, for your interesting story. But she could not help thinking there must be more to come. So she sat still and said nothing. When we were little, the mock turtle went on at last, more calmly, Though still sobbing a little now and then. We went to school in the sea. The master was an old turtle, and we used to call him Tall Toys. Why did you call him Tall Toys if he wasn't one? Alice asked. We called him Tortoise because he taught us, said the mock turtle angrily. Really? You are very dull. You ought to be ashamed of yourself for asking such a stupid, simple question, added the griffin. They both sat silent and looked at poor Alice, who felt ready to sink into the earth. At last, the griffin said to the mock turtle, Drive on, gold fellow. Don't be all day about it. And he went on in these words. Yes, we went to school in the sea. Though you mayn't believe it. I never said I didn't, interrupted Alice. You did, said the mock turtle. <laughs> Hold your tongue, added the griffin before Alice could speak again. The mock turtle went on. We had the best of... Educations. In fact, we went to school every day. I've been to school every day too, said Alice. You needn't be so proud of all that. With extras? asked the mock turtle a little anxiously. Yes, said Alice. We learned French and music. And washing? said the turtle. Certainly not. Said Alice indignantly. Ah, then yours wasn't really a good school, said the mock turtle in a tone of great relief. Now at ours, 
they had at the end of the bill. French, music, and washing. Extra. You couldn't have wanted it much, said Alice, living at the bottom of the sea. I couldn't afford to learn it. <sighs> said the Mock Turtle with a sigh. I only took the regular course. And what was that? inquired Alice. Reeling and writhing, of course, to begin with, the Mock Turtle replied. And then the different branches of arithmetic. Ambition, distraction, uglification and derision. I've never heard of uglification, Alice ventured to say. What is it? The griffin lifted up both its paws in surprise. What? Never heard of uglifying? It exclaimed. You know what to beautify is, I suppose? Yes, said Alice doubtfully. It means to make anything prettier. Well then, the griffin went on. If you don't know what to uglify is, you are a simpleton. Alice did not feel encouraged to ask any more questions about it, so she turned to the mock turtle and said, What else have you learnt? Well, there was mystery, the mock turtle replied, counting off the subject on his flappers. Mystery, ancient and modern, with seography, then drawling. The drolling master was an old conger eel that used to come once a week. He taught us drolling, stretching and fainting in coils. What was that like? said Alice. Well, I can't show it to you myself, the mock turtle said. I am... Um, too stiff, and the griffin uh, never learnt it. Hadn't time, said the griffin. I went to the classics master, though. He was an old crab, he was. I never went to him, the mock turtle said with a sigh. He taught laughing and grief, they used to say. So he did. So he did. Oh, said the griffin, sighing in his turn, and both creatures hid their faces in their paws. And how many hours a day did you do lessons? said Alice, in a hurry to change the subject. Ten hours the first day, said the mock turtle. Time the next, and so on. What a curious plan, exclaimed Alice. That's the reason they're called lessons, the griffin remarked, because they lessen from day to day. That was quite a new idea to Alice, and she thought it over a little before she made her next remark. Then, the eleventh day must have been a holiday. Of course it was, said the mock turtle. And how did you manage on the twelfth? Alice went on eagerly. Enough about lessons, the griffin interrupted in a very decided tone. Tell her something about the games now. That's the end of chapter nine. <clears throat> I had a totally different voice planned for the turtle before I started. And then suddenly this voice came out. But I love it. I totally love it. Sometimes <clears throat> if you wait until you feel like you're perfectly ready, you can't do it. You know what I mean? If you feel like you wait until you're going to do it 100% perfect, you never do it. And sometimes you just have to dive in. And sometimes the best things happen when you do that. <clears throat> so fun. Chapter 10 tomorrow, the lobster quadrille. We continue on with the griffin and the mock turtle. And they talk about a game being played. And... The mock turtle sings a song. And guess what? It's a whole bunch more 
nonsense. <laughs> oh, how funny. This book is so funny. So interesting. And it looks pretty short, actually. Interesting. So we are definitely three quarters of the way through. Um, I saw some people commented about um, the stories and what the dynamic is of the members of your family or you yourself who listen to the stories. Um, <clears throat> as I think I said before, I think Anne of Avonlea would be a really, or sorry, Anne of Green Gables, that's the first of the series, would be a really good compromise in that way. Um, I'm also looking into what children's poetry might be available to um, be able to read. That way it won't be as time investing on my part. And if it's children's poetry, then like I said, I, I don't have to prepare as much. There aren't as many characters involved. I don't have to go back and listen to how I interpreted characters before. It's just one character or at the most two characters that are going back and forth or just a narration voice. So I could do a children's poetry alongside a more adult story like a Jane Austen story or Charlotte Bronte story or something like that to keep young people's attention. So um, I'll be looking into what options. I hope you're enjoying this story. It's I'll be honest. I prefer the story stories to something as fantastical as this. It's harder for me to relate to and get as involved with the characters because it's so unrelatable. It's completely fantasy land, right? Um, but what I do love is how from the perspective of a child this all is. Like all this would make sense to a kid. They'd be like, yep, and then this happened, this happened, this happened. An adult would be like, well, wait, how did that happen? And a kid's like, yep, that's what happened. You know, I think that is really, really fun. Um, a bunch of silly, silly nonsense. <laughs> um, anyway, I hope you're having a good day and I'll see you for chapter 10 tomorrow. The Lobster Quadrille. Bye.